Good afternoon. I'm Mary Kramer, President-elect, filling in for our President, Bill Lesh, who's on vacation. I'd like to welcome our radio audience, club members, and their guests to the regular Friday meeting of the City Club of Portland. As is our custom, we'll introduce our new members first. There are quite a few of them. I'd like to ask them to stand after their name is called, and if the audience would hold their applause until all are introduced, I'd appreciate it. First, we have Julie Dietzler, community volunteer. Toby Finzel, uh, next week we have two open forums. On Wednesday, May 2nd, we have an open forum sponsored by the Government and Taxation Standing Committee, which is chaired by Richard Forrester. It's entitled, The Pros and Cons of Ballot Measure 5, School Funding Options. Presenter, presenters are State Senator Jane Cease, Susan Ward, who is co-chair of the committee, Oregon for School Finance, Stan Baumhofer, past director of People for Oregon, and John Danielson, lobbyist, Oregon Education Association. The forum will be held at 2 World Trade Center, 121 Southwest Salmon, conference rooms A and B, and that one is on Wednesday, 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. It's free and it's open to the public. On Thursday, the Law and Public Safety Safety Standing Committee, chaired by Tom Stanwood, and Portland State University's Center for Urban Studies are sponsoring an open forum entitled, Debate, Recall Over Firearms. It features Multnomah County Commissioner Rick Bauman and Alan Cook, Vice Chair Multnomah County Citizens for Safety Committee. Chip Greening of the Board of Governors will mo moderate this event on Thursday, May 3rd, noon, at PSU's Kramer Hall, room 171. It too is free and open to the public. Next Friday, May 4th, our regular Friday program will feature Ambassador Stanislas Chigradar. He will speak on Zimbabwe, Lessons for South Africa. Since 1980, his nation has abolished apartheid, established a racially unified society, and built a multi-party political system that now hangs in the balance. The program will be at the Benson Hotel, Mayfair Room. Our board host today is James Harris, member of the Board of Governors and an assistant vice president at First Interstate Bank. He has the privilege of asking the first question. After our speaker's remarks, we will open the meeting to questions from City Club members. Preference is given to questions from the mic, which will be at the back of the room. Written questions are accepted. If you would, after the speech, hold them up. Staff members will pick them up and bring them to the podium. Fast forward to 2000. Energy, which war do we fight and when does it start? The last few decades have seen the winds of energy blow hot with projections of skyrocketing demands, pleas for conservation, and renewable energy resources, and then cold, with my word we have lots of surplus energy. Last Sunday, Earth Day 1990, brought out millions of people making a statement that this is the green decade. On Tuesday, the U.S. Energy Department Chief, James Watkins, was reported to be pushing the Northeast for additional nuclear plants to meet the energy demands without any interest for conservation or renewable resources. And yesterday, Senator Kerry of Massachusetts said energy conservation is the number one environmental issue facing America. Change, ambivalence, and contradiction. Human beings have difficulty with that. A noted psychologist reports that when those kinds of conditions exist, the fearful are threatened because they believe things are going to get worse. The hopeful are encouraged because they believe things are going to get better. But the confident, they're inspired because they believe that they can make things better. Our speaker today belongs to the confident group. A Portlander, political pundit, and economic strategist, Dave Yaden has served as an advisor to Governor Goldsmith both in Portland and in Washington, D.C. He was a corporate planner for NERCO before accepting Governor Goldschmidt's appointment to be director of Oregon's Department of Energy. 
Challenges like the Salt Cave Dam and nuclear weapon waste at Hanford haven't altered his confidence. He believes Oregon can make the best decision about energy for the future. Please join me in welcoming Dave Yaden. Thank you, Mary. You have uh, no idea how happy I am to be here. I keep sending my phone number to Jack Faust, but uh, no town hall show recently. Let's face it, uh, despite the introduction, energy has been a rather boring story recently. Uh, rhetorically, it's uh, still good in public life for a few cheap thrills. New York Governor Mario Cuomo's State of the State Address this year stated, this is the decade of energy. How worried really is Mario? Several months later, he proposed shutting down his state's energy office. Uh, as a disinterested observer, I should comment that we have a much wiser governor here in the state of Oregon. So what is the real energy story? In very simple terms, it's this. I'm okay, you're okay. There is energy. No gas lines, no brownouts, lots of energy at prices we like because they are prices we ignore. We've even taken care of future generations, those not yet able to elbow their way into the table. We have planned, oh, have we planned. We have a regional electric energy plan. We have a state energy plan. We have contingency plans. We have utility least cost plans. We have Bonneville Power Administration resource acquisition plans. Even the Bush administration, wanting to get in on this planning thing, decided it needed an energy plan, so we're going to have a new national energy plan. Now, despite all this planning, what we may have here is a failure to communicate, a failure to communicate from the future back to the present. No matter how well we plan, it truthfully is hard to get the future to show us the whole script. The one thing we can count on is rather bizarre and improbable twists of plot. At the moment, the energy plot looks pretty darn good, even predictable. It is, however, that appearance of predictability which ought to alert us. If we know anything from the past, there may be something lurking out there that we didn't plan on. And even if there isn't, there still is this nagging suspicion that our planning may be better than our execution, our foresight may be better than our foreaction. It may be that our energy future is very much like the national debt. Everybody says it's a huge problem, but it doesn't affect anybody we know. More bark than bite. And the truth is that those of us in the energy business today don't know whether to bark to get your attention or whether to go quietly along our way. Now, since I'm here today, woof woof, here's my bark. <laughs> First, Energy conservation is more than the good thing we have been saying that it is. It's more than the good thing that our energy plans forecast. It is taking on more of the aspect of an economic and environmental imperative. That in itself, however, does not make it any more likely to happen. Secondly, we are just beginning to awaken to the full enormity of the environmental consequences of our energy decisions and the environmental constraints which will be placed upon our future decisions. Number three, we may not have ourselves organized in exactly the best way to solve number one and number two. An energy crisis, an energy scare, the moral equivalent of Pearl Harbor, gives us the motivation, but it does seem to make us go momentarily dumb as we scramble for shelter or, as we did in the 1970s, build the energy equivalent of Star Wars, we then called it the Synthetic Fuels Program, which protected us 
about as well as Star Wars and cost almost as much. Energy peace, on the other hand, gives us a chance to be wise. And we've been wise if you look, for instance, at the extraordinarily fine planning work done by the Northwest Power Planning Council. But a quiet peace doesn't stir us to do very much other than to change the channel to more interesting fare. Maybe that's fine. Maybe it's okay. If all works according to plan, OPEC won't be in the saddle again. And we are watchful at OPEC, in fact, is careful not to overstep itself these days. According to plan, local utilities will invest in helping customers save energy. They will buy power from co-generators, that is, large industrial plants who perhaps burn wood waste to raise both steam and electricity for their own use, and from new independent power producers, many of whom will develop renewable energy resources, perhaps geothermal, even perhaps some wind. If everything works according to plan, we will have electricity at stable rates for another 15 or so years before we need to build a coal, a coal plant or a nuclear plant. Natural gas will be competitive, reliable, available. It's a great plan, and it is designed to avoid the mistakes of the past. The bedrock of all this planning is conservation. The conservation record here in the Northwest, in fact, and in Oregon, is pretty darn good. It's not bad at all. Over the last 10 years, we have invested uh, better than a billion dollars in energy conservation. We've saved the equivalent output of a uh, small to medium-sized coal plant. And it's been very cheap power. On the electricity side, about a penny and a half per kilowatt hour, which is about one-third of what you pay in your monthly residential bill and a whole heck of a lot cheaper than building a new generating plant. It's a darn good deal. Now, I am proud to admit that the Oregon Department of Energy, in cooperation with the Power Planning Council and support of Bonneville Power Administration, runs what I think are some of the best and most efficient programs around, at no cost, incidentally, to the Oregon General Fund taxpayer. We run technical assistance programs, and we run low-interest loan programs and a variety of other programs. The city of Portland runs programs which are models for the rest of the nation, particularly in their weatherization programs for uh, rental units, which provide both energy efficiency and assistance for the low income. These are model programs. They are terrific programs. We ought to be a proud of them in the Northwest. But we've learned a few things along the way about energy conservation. One of the most surprising is that you won't invest in saving energy unless you get your money back almost immediately. Even a sophisticated business person, if told that a new piece of energy saving equipment will pay for itself in three years, likely will pass. He may say, well, if it pays for itself in one year, then maybe I'm interested. As long as we aren't motivated by expectations that those energy prices are going to keep going up, we have to bribe ourselves to do what's in our self-interest. It's not a very smart way to do business. We also find that those who benefit from investments in conserving energy sometimes are not those who pay the costs or make the decisions. We uh, want to upgrade the energy saving measures that are required in the building code for new homes uh, insulation, the amount of insulation, window quality, and so on. The Home Builders Association opposes a good portion of what we propose because it will increase the upfront cost of the housing. And we say back to them, yes, that's true, but the cost of housing is what it actually costs to live in that house each month, and we're reducing that monthly cost because the lower utility bills will more than offset any increase in the mortgage. So builders legitimately worry about the first time cost of housing, and we understand that worry. But it's homeowners who contend and must contend with the monthly energy bills and the monthly mortgage bills. One final disincentive to energy efficiency. We do put utilities in a somewhat awkward position when we say to them, look, we understand that the only way you really make any money to pay your bills is by selling kilowatts or gas through a meter 
but we really think what you ought to do is take some of your cash and invest it in conservation for your customers so they'll buy less of your money or buy less of your product and you'll take in less cash. It does put them in a bit of an awkward situation. Our public utility commissioners here in the state of Oregon and our utilities, I am pleased to say, are uh, actually diligently at work looking for ways to turn that situation around, looking for ways to make it in the self-interest of utilities and others to invest in conservation and in selling products, energy services, other than simply pushing kilowatts or gas through a meter. But we need to be honest. Conservation, for reasons that I'll advance in a moment, makes even more sense than we thought a few years back. But it's not an energy resource we turn on easily or quickly. To be more precise, it's not a resource we turn on quickly unless we poke ourselves in the ribs with a sharp stick, like gas lines or $3 per gallon gasoline or heating bills that go up every six months. Of course, the reason we do conservation is to avoid getting that painful poke in the ribs with the sharp stick. So we have this dilemma. The more we succeed with conservation, the less pain we feel, and the less pain we feel, the harder it is to remember why we were doing it in the first place. However, if we have trouble reminding ourselves, Mother Nature is starting to raise her voice to get our attention. Probably the greatest energy challenge we have ahead is to fully grasp how completely energy decisions are environmental decisions. We struggle to keep energy prices low. The catchword in this whole business these days is least cost planning. We require utilities to submit plans to the Public Utility Commission showing how they're going to generate electricity or energy in the future in the least cost way. But as we do that, we suspect that Mother Earth may be frowning because we aren't telling ourselves in the price we pay for energy the real long-term costs of air and water pollution or killing the fish runs. Costs that now get swept under some future generation's rug. The Hanford Nuclear Reservation is a tragic, monumental testament to the folly of ignoring these long-term environmental costs. For 40 years, the federal government made nuclear weapons out of the materials produced at Hanford, but the biggest bombshell of all is the discovery that it will take at a minimum 30 years and many tens of billions, that's with a B, billions of dollars to clean up that mess. It's under our rug. So there is no free lunch, and the cheap energy lunch we have been eating really isn't as cheap as we thought. So are we for cheap energy? or not. In all honesty, it depends. Do we want to encourage geothermal energy? Sure we do. But the two prime prospects at the moment are on the flanks of Crater Lake and within the proposed Newberry National Monument, both very environmentally sensitive areas. How about clean, cheap hydropower? For years we have watched the dams kill fish. Now with the filing of endangered species studies for certain of the salmon runs, we may witness the uh, energy equivalent of man bites dog, the fish that ate the dams. Much to my chagrin, I discover that even solar energy, supposedly the most environmentally benign of all our future resources, is not totally exempt, for it turns out that several desert animal species in California are endangered because of some of the California solar fields. We seem to have an uncanny ability to overlook at least some of the consequences of our actions. One of the invariable rules seems to be that today's answer is tomorrow's problem. Good example, wood stoves. Fifteen years ago, wood stoves were our first line of defense against OPEC, and we took them up, almost to the point that many in Oregon now believe that wood stoves, the right to burn wood in a wood stove, is a Second Amendment protection. <laughs> Today, however, they pollute the air. Another example, 
attempting to solve the acid rain problem at the expense, perhaps, of increasing greenhouse gas emissions such as carbon dioxide. Uh, and I'm not prejudging, incidentally, that uh, we have all the final answers on the greenhouse question. The West German government, to the applause of the world, acted boldly to require the installation of scrubbers on all its power plants, its coal-fired power plants, to reduce sulfur dioxide, acid rain producing emissions. But these very same scrubbers increase the amount of carbon dioxide given off, and having made this gigantic investment, I know firsthand, the German government is not eager to engage in discussions about how they can phase out the use of their coal plants as part of a global strategy for redu reducing carbon dioxide emissions. Um, incidentally, in the work that we in Oregon have been doing on this question of global warming, I have some staff people who have become experts in determining how much carbon dioxide is given off by uh, cutting trees or, uh, or grass seed, grasses for instance, and then how much CO2 is taken out of the air in this complicated cycle by replanting. Uh, so I can confirm what many of you have suspected. We do have in government people whose job it is to watch the grass grow. <laughs> so we want least cost energy, but we want it full cost in the sense of including all the environmental costs and consequences that might lie hidden out there. We want it cheap, but we want it environmentally honest. It's a little like the dilemma you have when your kid comes home and confesses that he is the one who threw paint on the neighbor's cat. You don't know whether to reward the honesty or punish for the act. We are about to face a very tough test of honesty on the Columbia River. Some have taken to referring to the salmon as the aquatic owl. Some of the salmon runs on the Columbia and Snake Rivers now are under review for endangered species status. Potentially, this could cut sharply into the production of hydro energy, it could curtail salmon harvest, it could impinge upon the amount of water going for irrigation and used for recreation. Potentially very large consequences. The event is proving two things. First, you can't anticipate everything in your plans. And secondly, it's hard to get organized ahead of time for the really big surprises. Energy decision making has changed. 20 years ago, a few people could get together in a small closed room and make big decisions. Dams got built, cooperative agreements were reached to give us a complex yet smoothly functioning reliable energy system. This worked quite well until in a distant land one of those small groups got together and called itself OPEC and in a room closer to home some folks got together and made a decision called whoops. So we learned our lesson. We don't let a few people go into a closed room and make big decisions. The energy business has restructured itself. In the electricity business, we have fostered the growth of independent power producers and of cogeneration by large industrial plants. We've created many more options for the generation of electricity other than reliance upon building a new coal plant or a nuclear plant, these large, expensive, centralized plants. That reduces the chance of making a big mistake, such as whoops, but it also makes it hard to resolve big, complicated issues when many people with many claims come to the table. There is no single institution which easily can bring all the interest to the table on this salmon question in the Columbia River. The Bonneville Power Administration, the Corps of Engineers, the Bureau of Reclamation all have a role in managing the river. Therefore, each, however, is also a claimant comes forth to assert a claim on how the river should be run and cannot claim to be a disinterested judge or the forum through which this issue should be resolved. The Northwest Power Planning Council, the only institution in the region charged by law both with planning for power generation and protection of fish, yet the role that the council 
can and will play in resolving this issue is an open question. The tremendous job that the council has done in planning does not necessarily, has not necessarily equipped it to easily bring together all those who actually manage the fisheries and the power generation and the irrigation. Resolving the issue will require an unprecedented degree of cooperation among strong, large, sophisticated interests, all with a good deal at stake. It truly will be a test of whether having dispersed the small groups going into a closed room to make big decisions, whether we can as a region pull ourselves back together to make a reasonable decision and achieve a reasonable solution. If all that happens is an assertion of claims for use of the river or for jurisdiction to resolve the question, then I think we're in for a tough go and a repeat of some of what we've seen in the Spotted Owl controversy. Now, I opened by saying that the plot for the energy story looks pretty darn good. Uh, the review that I then gave you may have sounded like a different movie, maybe a Nightmare on Elm Street, part six. Uh, let me close by saying that my expectations for our energy future and our energy plans, uh, largely I give it two thumbs up. But we have some work to do, not the least of which is to remember, don't believe our plans. We must act. We must act in our best interest, but we must always remain skeptical. We must always be asking ourselves, what have we missed? What have we failed to anticipate? And we also must understand that these plans, particularly when it comes to energy conservation, are not necessarily self-fulfilling. So what are the things that we should do? Well, I believe we should do these. We should push ahead as the PUC, Public Utilities Commission, and our utilities are doing to find incentives for the utilities and others to invest in conservation and to make conservation profitable for them as is the generation of ever more electricity. Let's find a way to make sure that the least cost plans are also profitable plans. Secondly, I think we need to push ahead testing ways to incorporate environmental costs and consequences in our energy decisions. And here, read my lips. That may mean an increase in gasoline taxes. It might mean, for instance, might, a tax on CO2 emissions. I would um, hazard even a uh, suggestion of a magic wand. Let's agree that every six months from now until either the Democrats take the White House or the Republicans take Congress, so it'll be a very long time <laughs> in either case, every six months, Every six months, let's increase the tax on gasoline by five cents. Every six months. Not 50 cents now and we're done with it, but let's build in the expectation that the price of gasoline is going to go up a nickel every six months. My guess is that without doing a single other thing, many good things would begin to happen. Now, I suspect that this idea is going to take some time to catch on, but uh, just when I looked in the mirror this morning, I discovered that the number of supporters had doubled, so <laughs> I'm encouraged. <laughs> Three, I think we really do have to put aside our institutional turf concerns and decide that we're going to resolve this salmon issue and the balance of interests on the Columbia River in a way which is best for the whole region. Above all, my friends, do not sit back and let the interests only solve this on their terms. Too much is at stake. Uh, four, until I gain more allies for my magic wand, we probably have to keep slogging it out the hard way day by day to gain energy efficiency. We need these building codes that I talked about. We need to get them enforced. We need to get better energy efficiency building built into all the uh, commercial buildings that are going up. And don't overlook the energy gains to be had from getting the land use and transportation decisions right here in the metropolitan region. Now, if that sounds ho-hum, consider that Los Angeles 
has decided that just in order to breathe and survive, that within 20 to 30 years, they have got to replace the gasoline-powered automobile, seven million of them, in the Los Angeles Basin, and convert to electric-powered cars. Now, there's a sharp stick <laughs> in the ribs. If it sounds laughable, and we don't really think that's going to happen, then perhaps getting the land use and transportation decisions right in the metropolitan region here in Portland doesn't sound quite so ho-hum. It is very real. Okay, finally, let's really get into the mood. Let's remind ourselves what the energy crisis was really like. Everybody go home, put Louie Louie on the record player, and take a cold shower. Thank you. <laughs>
I am somewhat skeptical myself that the effort to find a solution in the underground uh, of Nevada will work and that ultimately we may be forced with having to make a pact with the devil and with ourselves to say we're going to have to keep this nuclear waste above ground where we can see it and monitor it and uh, uh, just to remind ourselves that that's, that's what we've got. Um, with regard to the first part of the question, uh, we, are go we are developing more and more small, flexible ways to generate electricity on site. There are a lot of places in the world already where uh, wind power, solar power makes an awful lot of sense. California has even found that on a large scale, uh, wind power and, uh, and solar begin to make sense. Uh, we pay about four and a half cents on average per kilowatt hour for energy up here. They're generating out of wind and solar energy eight to nine cents per kilowatt hour. So the costs, the costs are coming down and we are finding more and more ways to have smaller units um, at dispersed sites. So that's probably going to continue to be the wave, the wave of the future. Hi, my name is uh, Jeff Carr. I'm a City Club member. Given the need to uh, make sure that the discussion of the threatened and endangered species issue is broadened, what do you think would be the appropriate forum for this discussion, the NIMPS or the Council or maybe some new group? And how do we ensure that that discussion is, is broadened? Could you go into that a little bit more? Thanks. The question was, how can we ensure that the resolution of the endangered species a question about salmon on the Columbia is as broad as I suggested it should be. Uh, the actual resolution of that issue lies within the National Marine Fisheries Service, which must make the decision. Um, there are a couple of ways we could proceed. Uh, one, it is possible uh, that the Northwest Power Planning Council could act as a forum to bring all the interests, the irrigators, the power generators, the fishery managers, and so on, to the table, but not necessarily within the context of the, the, enter, the power planning council uh, planning process. In other words, don't attempt to fit it necessarily through that straitjacket, but still use the good offices. It is, after all, the most logical of the institutions. Uh, but it is also seen by some of the parties as having its own interests or having its own biases uh, build up over the years. Uh, I think we probably need to look for whether it's in the National Marine Fisheries Service process or through the good offices of the Power Planning Call Council or even perhaps through the governor's offices of the states uh, convening some ad hoc group uh, with, the with the broadest possible um, representation and with a clear understanding that we have basically two years to resolve this issue before the National Marine Fisheries Service has to decide the question. So we've got a limited time when we still have reasonable options to decide how to balance all these interests before you end up actually listing the salmon or certain salmon runs as, as endangered. And we lose, literally lose control of some of the things we can do. Is a one minute question all right? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Gregory Kafuri. I'm co-director of the Campaign to Close Trojan. We agree that there is a massive amount of waste of electricity out there and that the players and the people need sharp sticks in order to prod them into getting behind the conservation plans which, which you've already devised. In that context, do you think that people in your position would do a service if they would make clear to the people of the Northwest by the forums that they have available to them, the unfolding magnitude of the Chernobyl catastrophe. I'm speaking of the new Soviet estimate, the government estimate of 358 billion, with a B, dollars in property damage alone, in the Soviet Union alone, of stories from the Ukrainian Medical Association of two million children suffering radiation sickness. Do you think that that story should be brought out in order to convince people what needs to be done. Greg, you and others are doing such a good job, it's hard for me to know what I could add. <laughs> um, it is a story which is being told and I think will be told appropriately through the, the news media. And frankly, I don't know much more than that myself right now. That is what's, what's available to us. Um, I don't have much more to say about that. I am very concerned that we know that people do know exactly uh, 
what the choices are for them here in the Northwest. Thank you. Ray Polani, a City Club member. Uh, Mr. Yeadon, uh, with uh, transportation being the biggest single end use of energy, uh, I was very pleased to hear you recommend uh, increased gas taxes, five cents every six months. But uh, the thought occurs that uh, at the state level, there is a constitutional restriction, which means that all of this money, if raised at the state level, would have to be spent on highways, fostering more use rather than less. At the federal level, I guess it's a little better because the federal government has impounded a substantial amount of uh, uh, federal gas taxes to mask the deficit, and perhaps that's what should be done, but it's not on a permanent basis, it's not on a serious basis. Uh, what, what do you suggest? How do you think uh, we can uh, really devote this additional money to transportation alternatives? such as uh, increased rail and increased public transit. How can we do it? Well, um, as a state official, I'm not uh, allowed to take a position on a ballot measure, so let me make it clear that I'm not taking a position on a ballot measure. I am simply noting the factual situation that if people approve what's on the ballot in May and in terms of allowing uh, some of the additional tax, uh, regist auto registration fee uh, constitutionally to go for local transit decisions, so long as local districts actually vote to do so, uh, that that factually would provide some more money. But that's only the Is that accurate, uh, Ray? Yeah, it's accurate. <laughs> but it would only be the additional. What about the existing part? Uh, that, that's a serious problem, isn't it? But let's hope they begin, huh? Again, I would say that uh, getting the land use decision correct uh, is, is fundamentally, uh, fundamentally important. Uh, look to Los Angeles uh, for the example of what we don't want to do. David, my name is Bill Hale. <clears throat> I'm a uh, city club member. And uh, you have another supporter here for the gas tax idea. However, um, I would uh, require that all the money be uh, used for conservation purposes. Uh, it's interesting, I, uh, I'm in the process of uh, insulating my home uh, through the Oil Heat Institute. They have a program uh, where you can borrow up to $5,000 at 6.5% interest. They'll come in and do a complete analysis of, uh, of your home to determine the best way to insulate your house. You go out and get the bids and you can borrow the money at 6.5% and the payback is quite attractive. Um, I also at one time uh, had another home at which I insulated uh, during the 70s when this gas crisis was on and our state had a program where they provided a substantial uh, tax credit. Now this is available only to lower income people. Um, I'm going to go ahead and insulate fully, but certainly that would have been a nice incentive to provide that. Basically, um, it is my belief that the conservation begins with the individual. It would be amazing to see how many houses or how much electricity, gas, and oil use could be reduced by insulating all the houses in the Northwest up to present code standards. And I would like your opinion on uh, what we can do to foster this kind of thinking at the political level to uh, provide more incentives for homeowners to reduce their costs. I think there ought to be some limits, frankly, on how many incentives we provide through the general tax structure. Uh, I am well aware of the competing demands upon taxation today. Uh, we are not taking care of all the demands, all the legitimate needs that are out there, whether it's uh, drug abuse or education. Uh, I think we have enormous problems that we've got to deal with in making sure that the young people who are coming up now are prepared for the challenges that lie ahead. So I'm not in favor of taking income tax money from the people of Oregon to provide incentives, greater incentives, for us to do what's already in our self-interest. I am very much in favor of making it in the self-interest of utilities uh, and other providers to invest in conservation. And I would come back to that and say that that, I believe, is where we really have to look. I am, a New England utility that I know, for instance, is spending about a third of its total capital budget on conservation measures, and they are being allowed by their local utilities or by their local regulators to split 
with their customers some of the savings from doing that rather than going out and building, say, a new gas-fired a gas-fired turbine. It's an example, perhaps, of how we can encourage uh, this behavior. Molly Ingram, City Club member. Um, <clears throat> I worked on the Hanford Project for three years, and you can check with my husband, I don't glow in the dark. Um, I have two questions, or a two-part question. One is, uh, I am aware of the initiative to close Trojan, and I would like to know, uh, in your opinion, how that will change our energy picture, if that does happen. And also, how do our energy plans <clears throat> match up in general with our economic development plans? How, how are we balancing this when we are very much wanting to create economic development in Oregon, and much of that is related to industries which not only use power to produce what they produce, but produce things that use more power, like high tech? On the impact of closing Trojan, I have to admit that uh, we haven't done a recent analysis of what the uh, what what the effect uh, would would be. I know uh, several years ago when this issue was on the ballot, uh, I think the department looked at it, and as I recall, and I hesitate to say that I know I'm accurate on this, but I think that they calculated at that time that uh, it would result in roughly a 10 percent increase in energy prices. Uh, to uh, PGE customers. Uh, that's the best I can do for you uh, right now on that one. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second? I have to <laughs> ask what was the second part? Ah, uh, yes. The relationship between uh, energy, energy conservation, and energy decisions and economic development. The governor has stated that he believes in the long term Oregon's economic development depends very importantly upon preservation of the kind of environment that we now have, that we don't sell it out cheaply, and that in the long term, maintaining energy costs low, as low as we can, will be an economic advantage for the state of Oregon. Now, we sometimes get confused between the energy prices we pay today and long-term costs. We can, in many ways, reduce the long-term costs of energy, keep our future bills down by investing more today, for instance, in, in energy conservation or some of the renewable technologies. So I think that what we would say is we probably want to be very careful about trying to buy into Oregon with very cheap current rates, energy uh, intensive industries, uh, which are simply going to drive up costs later on. We don't want to give away our land, our air, our water, or our energy in a short-sighted effort to bring indus industry in. But long-term, keeping those costs down, that means doing the conservation correctly, uh, getting what we can, focusing on the renewables, staying on the plans, uh, we will have an economic advantage. So it's a difference between short-term and long-term uh, outlook. Uh, Mr. <coughs> Vader, I'm a Larry Griffith City Club member. Uh, your uh, energy position and your policies that you've been developing for the state of Oregon seem to be very fundamentally sound and some pretty deep thinking. But I'm a little uh, troubled by the fact that uh, I don't know where Oregon is going standing alone as it seems to on so many issues that deal with such subject matter. And I'm wondering just how widespread throughout the country are you finding any uh, uh, counterparts and state government such as yourself. Uh, 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 we're out on the limb here on land use planning largely and then when all these new people come into Oregon they try to kick our land use planning around. Uh, uh, if we want to find out how not to do anything we turn our eyes south to California and I think we find some good examples of that. Uh, the Reagan administration lulled us to sleep on energy itself and I don't think that the public has awakened yet to that uh, uh, lullaby that they had sung to them for about eight years. So uh, just uh, tell me, what, what does the future hold for you uh, uh, as a department head in energy conservation and, uh, and uh, development, future development, and uh, along with some of the other states in this country? Uh, wh where is our national agenda going? Is there going to be such a thing? The National Energy Plan that is taking some shape within the Bush administration 
is a break from uh, the uh, sort of devil may care planning or lack thereof of the Reagan administration. It does be, uh, appear to give some, uh, as it's taking shape, real emphasis to both the environmental uh, issue and to the significance of conservation. Again, that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that it's going to happen or that uh, Mr. Bush is about to endorse a 50 cent per gallon gasoline uh, tax. There is in this business, you're right, very much a kind of what, uh, why should I act on my own? Uh, I'm just a, a small dot, just a decimal point in the whole, uh, in the whole business. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be in Europe several months back discussing with the Germans and the Dutch uh, global warming. And there seemed to be this universal agreement. Global warming is a global problem requiring a global solution and enormous international cooperation. You go first. And <laughs> to some extent, that's where we are uh, on energy. All I can say is it is very much in our self-interest, if we look any single day <laughs> beyond tomorrow, uh, to, do, uh, to do what we can for ourselves. Uh, but that's the way it's going to get done. A final plug for the Power Planning Council and for Bonneville Power Administration. Frankly, both of these institutions have helped tie us together and allowed us to do some things as a region which we would not otherwise be able to do. Uh, and we ought to work to sustain the, both those institutions as, as regional entities. I'm Carla Kelly, City Club member. Uh, you talked about conservation, and I think as part of our global thinking about conservation, uh, we need to think about making the wisest use of the fuels that we've got. You also mentioned combustion turbines and gas-fired combustion turbines. Given the relative inefficiency of using gas to make electricity to heat homes as compared to using gas directly for space or water heating, is the department going to be taking any position on this use of the fuel that is for combustion turbines, or do you have a personal position? We have in cooperation uh, with the Public Utility Commission recently instituted a look at the question of should we attempt through public policy to allocate fuels towards their best uses. That is, you use electricity to run motors and light light bulbs, but you use natural gas to heat homes and uh, make hot water. Our position has been uh, that uh, these fuels are best left to compete on a price and quality basis in the marketplace uh, and until we see some things changing we think that's probably still true but we have instituted a study to look at how significant are these issues in terms of fuel switching and fuel allocation and uh, we'll know a little bit more uh, in the time ahead. Some states have gone ahead, uh, California for instance has said uh, uh, no new electric water heaters. I believe that's, that's, that's correct. Well that doesn't necessarily work here in the Northwest because we have different electricity prices, different gas prices, and so on. So it's, uh, it's uh, a rather more complicated issue. Uh, Kurt Wabring, City Club member. Uh, about a year ago, the EPA did a study on global warming. When they looked at tree species on the East Coast, hemlock and maples would migrate northward, uh, essentially outside the United States, uh, because of the effects of the warming, and that this would likely occur within the next 50 years. Uh, uh, could you comment on what you think the impacts might be on Douglas fir and our forests here uh, with, in global warming in the next 50 to 100 years? In the examination we have done of, of global warming, the first conclusion is that the models don't allow us to get anywhere close to really predicting uh, what would happen in a given region. They're uncertain enough as it is in terms of what the global effects uh, would be uh, with regard to how much the seas might rise or what the change in precipitation in very large regions should, would be. So we are very, very nervous about predicting too much other than to say it would appear because primarily of changes in timing and amounts of precipitation uh, that uh, we would change the species that, that are growing here. But again, I, I'm very hesitant to, to get too much, to predict too much about what that might mean. I would say that of all the work I've seen on global warming, 
Uh, it turns out that one of the smartest things we can do is plant trees. Uh, that's a happy circumstance for Oregon, and if it turns out that the globe is someday going to decide that it's valuable to have people plant trees, our unforested forest land may become slightly more valuable. <laughs> My name is Dolores Hurtado. I'm a City Club member. A recent um, out-of-town visitor asked me what the state of Oregon was doing to um, implement the action of the legislature calling for a 20 percent reduction in our carbon dioxide contribution to uh, the global warming problem by, I think, the year 2000. And I wasn't able to answer her question. I'd like to ask you that, what progress has been made in developing a plan for the state of Oregon to meet that goal that I believe was set by the legislature? Uh, we have completed a plan in draft. Uh, we're one of the few states, actually, I think, to have done as much work on this issue as, uh, uh, as any state. Uh, what we've concluded is we don't know enough about this phenomenon to, to jump on to either a firm conclusion about whether it's happening or all of the steps that we might take. Rather, what it's done is sort of act like a multiplier effect in reinforcing the things we're doing or want to do for other reasons, including conservation and use of renewables. Uh, so one, we would say that energy conservation remains absolutely at the top of the list. Short term, again, let me go back to short term actions that we can take without necessarily having to resolve uh, will this get us to a 20 percent reduction or not? Frankly, I think worrying over that, that issue is, may uh, tie us up forever. Um, I am looking at whether I have the legal authority now to begin a program to recycle chlorofluorocarbons uh, out of uh, automobiles, uh, out of uh, 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 refrig yeah, air conditioning. Uh, units. If we don't, we're going to go to the legislature and get it. That's something that ought to be done and ought to be right, done right now. Two, the land use decision here in Portland. Get, get that one right. Three, all of the energy conservation measures that we've talked about. If we're going to get to a 20 percent reduction uh, across the, across the uh, U.S. by the year 2005, uh, we're probably going to have to shut down some presently burning, uh, emitting uh, coal plants. Um, it's a tough one to do, but um, could be done. Thank you, Dave. We are adjourned.